Wait, before you read the Agile Manifesto, let's bring some context into this. This video is going to talk about the history leading up to the Agile Manifesto, specifically the first sort of 10 years, 12 years from the 1989, 1990s on to 2001. We're going to talk about the value that was created or not created that led to the dot-com boom and bust. We're then going to talk about the flow of technology and software development that was happening through that time and how lightweight methodologies outperformed heavier methodologies like waterfall. We'll end on the ski trip in 2001 where 17 people came together and they had food and drink and fun and they came out with an agile manifesto. I'm Mike the Agile Coach from Surge Management. Let's get into it. Nineteen nineties, what a decade. The internet landed, we had Java created, 2G mobiles were created. Who remembers their 3210? Yep, 3210, 3310 was cool. Plain Snake. I used to love Plain Snake. Amazon and eBay had just been created in the 90s. Facebook wasn't even around. What did we used to do before Facebook? Probably used to talk to each other. That was a good time. Java, Palm Pilots, wow. there was plenty around the 90s. It was good fun. But a somewhat forgotten part of the 90s was in the fact that in 1987, we had a recession. 1990, 1991, America had another recession. In the, in the early 1990s, America went through a jobless recovery from their recessions. They did recover, but they didn't get any new jobs. The Fed reduced interest rates from 6% down to 3%, hoping to spur some much wanted investment into new jobs. In America, there was investment. Affordable capital did go into new investments. However, they went into the best ROI possible. And at that time, technology was starting to boom. Technology allowed organizations to become operationally excellent. It meant that things cost less. And if things cost less, companies had a greater competitive advantage. Greater competitive advantages only last a short period of time if they're based on operational excellence. Prices have to continue going down to match other companies doing the same thing. So these companies were in a price war all through the mid 1990s. That's great for the consumer. The consumer's prices, especially in America, just went skyrocketing down. So although there wasn't many new jobs created in the early 1990s, it did reduce inflation. Prices went down and that helped investment into the stock market to follow. So from America having a 7% unemployment rate, moving from a manufacturing economy into a finance economy, from organizations creating more jobs to fuel growth, to reducing jobs to increase efficiency. There were some big changes throughout America. Now, the problem was, is that America went through what's classed as a multiplier effect. The more the organizations became operationally excellent, the cheaper the goods had to become. The cheaper the goods had to become, the consumer would save money. The consumer would save money and invest in companies that were fueling beta growth. And the growth at the time was being lean. Now, these companies were investing in technology companies and in technology for themselves. Massive amounts of technology was being completed in software. The internet was on the rise, the intranet was used, be using more and more, and companies were able to outsource a lot of their costs to other technology companies. Over 1995 to 2000, many, many companies started up. Universities such as Harvard 
used to give people to banks. Suddenly, these very intelligent people were not going to banks. They weren't going to finance. They were going into technology. They were going to startups, technology startups, Silicon Valley. So we have a whole bunch of very intelligent people in new growth markets that were enabling older legacy companies to become efficient. But those companies that were growing didn't just sell to one company, they sold to as many as they could. That helped commoditize all of the services and the manufacturing goods that were coming afterwards. So a lot of companies were suddenly being priced matched against other companies. They couldn't get a competitive advantage. They couldn't move fast enough. And you suddenly have technology companies who are being way more agile. They're able to move quickly and being dynamic. And these big companies are wondering, well, what's going on? Why are they moving so fast? At the time, the gold standard of methodologies to deliver software was called Waterfall. It was created in the 1970s by Sage, and it was taken as the, the must-do by the military in America and by the governments at the time. And this was very similar throughout uh, the UK, very similar in Australia. Waterfall was a methodology that was used that was fantastic at actually delivering software as per the need of the execs or the stakeholders at the time. So technology companies started booming. They um, were doing better than all other companies. America was doing very well during the late 1990s. Were they creating value? Did customers tangibly take that information? Did they start using it? Were the products at the end of it? Well, we started seeing two diversions and we, we saw on one side, companies that were doing very well operational excellence wise, uh, however, being commoditized slowly. The global service industry may create 24 million new jobs for our America, but it didn't actually help America long-term. These jobs were only here for a short period of time, although productivity went up by 2.8% per year. You didn't actually see any increases in wages. You had overall GDP rise, but the people at the um, working level didn't see a substantial rise in their wages proportional to productivity. Now, Gordon, 2000, stated that we would see a black hole because there's a diminishing returns to technology. And there was. You could only go so far. You could only take on so much operational excellence. You could only do so, be so lean. However, what Gordon didn't realize was, is that these companies were solving new problems. They were helping the competitive advantage of companies through branding, through climate change, through emotions. The customer changed. We can't take what used to happen and overlay that with, with our new technology. So what were the companies that were doing best? They were the ones who were quickly adapting to the customer needs. They were the companies that were able to, to take a short amount of requirements and flip them on the head quickly. They were changing their requirements on new information. And this is why large companies would outsource to these smaller dynamic companies for software development. And that was great up until 2000, when we saw that the ones that were not creating value, uh, suddenly rose tinted glasses were gone and we had the dot-com crash. These companies like pets.com, they had no value. Amazon did decrease by I think 70 or 80% in stock value, but the value of Amazon was still there and that came back very fast. And the last 20 years has now become a first trillion dollar business. Why? It solved an actual problem. It saw an opportunity. It saw that people were using the internet tenfold and found a niche way to sell books to begin with and then flowed on from that. Olina and Scully in 2000 stated that the technology multiplier, i.e. the amount of money that you would get back from technology was 1.25. 
A 25% return on investment was huge. And this was the start of it. 2000 was the start of this new idea around um, massive gains in venture capitalism, especially for technology companies. And now if we look at the, um, the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500, we'll see more technology companies on there providing emotional customer needs than we will see the um, uh, property or, or steel makers or road makers because that's been commoditized now. Like, there's a price and it's a bottom line price and you compete on price. Brand and customer experience from 2000 to 2004 onwards became the, the competitive advantage. So if we looked at 1990s to 2000 software development, what was the attributes? What were the values of these methodologies that were outperforming waterfall? Well, the great thing about them was a lot of them actually knew each other. And from a grassroots point of view, we're talking about the similarities in those methodologies. I think they were called lightweight methodologies. You had Scrum, you had adaptive programming, you had Crystal, you had DSDM, you had feature-driven development, you had adaptive software development, you had, ah, you had quite a few. But 17 of those people came together in Utah just to have a quick chat, some food, and to just talk about the future of basically their, their lightweight methodologies for software development. I do agree that the mindset is what led them there. The idea to, be, to having agility. Now remember, agility has been around for a long time. Napoleon used to empower his people to make decisions dynamically. So agility has been around for a long time. And thought leaders, they focus on that mindset and that helps them create uh, similarities in their values. So these 17 people all came to Utah, have a little ski, have some kai, really enjoyed themselves. And suddenly, surprisingly to a few of them, came up with four specific values that help combine their methodologies. They came up with a brand. This brand was known as Agile. They came up with a company. The company was called the Agile Alliance. I really hope you like the context. It makes way more sense when you think of it in terms of what the world, especially America, was going through, through the 1987 recession, the 1991 recession, the dot-com up and boom, how technology took over, how the customer changed from these massive segmentations to these very small niche markets, how there was a gold standard of methodologies, waterfall, that the American and UK, UK government used to say, you must use these. However, the UK government can't stop Lloyds Bank going to an outsourced company that uses Scrum. Now suddenly, Lloyds Bank is outperforming Barclays because they're outsourcing their software development to a company who uses Scrum. These methodologies came together, created a brand, and from, from then on, as you're trying to create a movement. Great news is, we're seeing this movement transcend what looks like their original beliefs. The four values, the 12 principles, have a read of them now. And if you've read them already, have a read of them again. Now you understand what led these people to this point. And I bet you, you'll have a different view of why software development in 2001 had to be rebranded to Agile and, while, and why everyone thinks that Agile is a methodology. Now, I will fully admit, Agile software development from the Agile Manifesto is software development. It says it in the title. But the mindset that came up with those values, the agility mindset, which has led to strategic agility, organizational strategic um, marketing, sales, HR, super leadership. These things have all been around since the um, 1950s with Hertzberg, um, 1890s with um, Marx. 
You've got 1990s studies going through this. You've got um, 2000 Harvard Literature Review around the orchestra model for marketing. These things have been around for a very long time. Yet, we think that Agile is kind of like taking over. Agile is being leveraged mostly by consultants to push them their way into other parts of the organization to get outside of IT. Agile software development, lightweight methodologies, great. Agile mindset, much better. That's where you see your 4X. That's where you see your customer value. But from a 2001 point of view, 17 lightweight methodologies coming together and talking about something because the last 10 years, there's been heavy investment into technology, but no idea on value creation. Excellent. Have a read of the um, Agile Manifesto. It's a good read. The values are great. The principles are great. And then uh, there's another video coming to talk about uh, in depth what the values mean and the principles mean. Right? Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm Mike, the Agile Coach from Surge Management. And we've just gone through the history and context of how the Agile Manifesto came about. We discussed whether value was created or not created, uh, the dot-com boom and, and crash. And then we talked about the circumstances of lightweight methodologies that led to the creation of the Agile Manifesto. Awesome. Thanks, guys.